This is The Red Line, where we interview three geopolitical experts on one big issue shaping the news both here and overseas. And I'm your host, Michael Hilliard. Depending on who you're speaking with, Iran's mountainous borders could be viewed as either a fortress protecting its own people from the outside world, or a wall confining the Persian Empire to its current domain. And whilst the thought of mountains being the thing that prevents your country from expanding seems like a somewhat antiquated thought, when we look into it a bit more closely, this idea of a Persian fortress actually does start to present evidence. Because from Tehran's perspective, and looking around at a map, it seems that Iran faces a tough route for expansion on every single front. As an example, towards the north of Iran, it has Azerbaijan, Armenia and the Caucasus, all of which have become increasingly stable, particularly in recent times. And any expansion in this direction could quickly draw in other players like Russia and Turkey, whilst also likely triggering large-scale uprisings at home. And if we put that aside and look to the west, we have the border between Iran and Turkey, another military power whose strength is beginning to show its prowess throughout not only the Middle East, but also in some of the areas of North and East Africa that Iran once viewed as its potential expansion areas. Bordering that, we have the Levant area to Iran's west. An area that, whether it be the Iran-Iraq war, or the war in Syria, or the separatist movements in Kurdistan, has proved to be a persistent source of instability right along Iran's western frontiers, and an issue for Tehran that requires constant attention and supply. If we look to the south of that, across the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea, we see not only their regional rivals in Saudi Arabia and the UAE, but also some of the largest US military bases anywhere in the world, all of which are very willing to assert their position in the region. And even if we follow that around to Iran's eastern borders, the often forgotten areas of the country, we see that Iran borders countries like Pakistan, a nuclear armed state currently facing instability and driving up a Baluch nationalist movement that also spills over into Iran. We see Afghanistan with a government who just went into active war with Iran and Turkmenistan, a country with enough gas reserves to change global economies. On every single front and every single axis that Iran looks at, tension and instability seems frankly abundant. And Iran has to fight all of these fires at once at the expense of a continuously dwindling budget. So how does Iran decide what its strategic priority should be? Why is it necessary for Iran to get so involved in the affairs of its neighboring states? And how do recent developments in countries like Armenia, Syria, Afghanistan, and Saudi Arabia change the calculations being made inside Tehran? Well, to answer all that, we turn to our first guest. Part 1 the exposure in the east iran has not only an extremely complicated and proud military legacy but it's also got its own intellectual history that dates back thousands of years michael rubin is a senior fellow at the american enterprise institute where he specializes in iran turkey and the broader middle east he's also previously served in the pentagon and the office of the u.s secretary of defense as an advisor on Iran and Iraq, as well as a political advisor to the Provisional Authority in Baghdad. He's also been a lecturer on the subject at Yale University, and a widely respected analyst when it comes to Iraq, Iran, and the defense capabilities. And we're thrilled to have him back on the program today. Wars in the Middle East aren't caused by water, and they're not caused by oil. Fundamentally, they're caused by overconfidence. The United States spends 40 plus billion dollars in our intelligence community. And we can talk about what we know about Iran, but we so seldom talk about what we don't know about Iran. One of the key factors we don't know, we talk about hardliners versus reformers in terms of the political sphere. But what are the factional divisions within the Revolutionary Guard? We know they're not homogenous. And yet, 44 years after the Islamic Revolution, we really have no clue about the way things are working. Now, before delving deeper into this subject, it's probably worth going over some of the basics of how Iran's military and government are structured, and obviously oversimplifying it for time, but Iran has a civilian and theocratic branch as a government. And whilst the civilian government is elected by the people through elections, the theocratic one is led by an assembly of experts made up of religious clerics. The civilian government, currently led by President Ibrahim Raisi, is in charge of picking ministers and departments and running most of the day-to-day of government, whilst the theocratic arm, led by Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, will make decisions on things like who is allowed to run for president, as well as who is in charge of the Iranian military. And this is where Iran greatly divulges from a military like the United States. And to explain why, let's take you through the structure of how the Iranian military breaks down. At the top of the order is the military office of the Supreme Leader, effectively the military advisors to the Ayatollah, 
who are in charge of the general staff of the armed forces. And this is where the Iranian military breaks into three branches. The first one is the regular military, the Islamic Republic Army of Iran. And this branch is what most people would probably think of as your standard national military, with branches like the ground forces, the navy forces, the air force, and air defense forces. The second charge of the general staff is the country's law enforcement, your standard police and whatnot. But the third charge is probably the most interesting one, and that would be the IRGC, or the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. This is almost another completely separate armed forces operating parallel to the national armed forces, with the IRGC having its own ground forces, its own navy, its own aerospace forces, as well as two completely unique branches, one of those being the Quds Force, a dedicated force specializing in irregular warfare and operations overseas, as well as another force called the Besiege, a paramilitary force often full of the most religiously zealous fighters, and almost universally deployed internally within Iran. So whilst the Quds Force often operates overseas, the Besiege often operates within Iran. So again, the Iranian military breaks down to a national army, a police force, and the IRGC. And the IRGC isn't just some small offshoot either. In fact, depending on which study you want to look at, its capacity is either just below or possibly even equal to that of the national army. Now, this is probably oversimplifying, but it's shorthand to make it easier to understand. The national army defends Iran, whilst the IRGC defends the revolution. And now that we've got most of the basics behind us, Michael, can you take us through how the IRGC not only gets its funding, but also operates in neighboring countries like Iraq? In both the Iranian constitution, as well as in the founding statutes of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, it says the purpose of the Islamic Republic and the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps is to export revolution. So when we're talking about what the Revolutionary Guard is doing in Iraq, it fundamentally is sponsoring insurgency. Its special groups are seeking to use bombs and bullets in order to impose what might not be in people's hearts and minds. The Revolutionary Guard became the elite back during the Iran-Iraq War from 1980 to 1988. They didn't want to go back into the barracks afterwards, and so without more equivalents, they took their equivalent of the Army Corps of Engineers, went into the civilian infrastructure. If you want to understand what the economic wing of the Revolutionary Guard's like, it's like taking the Army Corps of Engineers, merging with Bechtel, Halberton, KBR, Northrop Grumman, Boeing, ExxonMobil, and Walmart. According to the Iraqis, and I spend a lot of time in Iraq for the last three or four years, especially when Iran was laboring much more under sanctions, the money was actually flowing from Iraq into Iran rather than vice versa. Now, what this means is if the official budget of the Revolutionary Guard is $5 billion per year, as it was a few years ago. The smuggling income across the Persian Gulf, the Strait of Hormuz, is another 11 to $13 billion. But if you do the analysis, the single source no bid contracts equal about 40 to $50 billion in some years. So if parliament of Iran came to an epiphany that these guys are terrorists, we're gonna take their budget to zero, they'd be facing less of a budget cutback than for example, the Americans did through sequestration when we took a 10% cut of our defense budget. The point of this is the Revolutionary Guard no longer depend on the Iranian budgetary process, so they can do what they want in Iraq, they can do what they want in Yemen, they can do what they want in Lebanon, and if we're negotiating with the foreign ministry, they don't answer to the foreign ministry. So in effect, what we've created is a self-licking ice cream cone. The Revolutionary Guard continues to make money in these countries or to solicit money from these countries and then reinvest that money in order to expand its operations as it exports revolution even further. Now, from what the reports tell us, this dynamic between the National Army and the IRGC has been further fueled by the US sanctions, as whilst these sanctions primarily target official Iranian accounts and official structures, the IRGC has a much easier time using shell companies or even other multinational companies in their subsidiaries, particularly things like subsidiaries of the China National Petroleum Company, to launder their money far more easily than the National Army could, therefore making it much easier for the IRGC to get hold of money as opposed to the Iranian army getting hold of money, which in all honesty is probably the opposite effect of what the sanctions are trying to do. So how widespread is this using of outside companies in order to launder international money back into the IRGC's pockets? In Iran, you can say that almost everything is money laundering because you don't really have commercial law, which is one of the reasons why so many Western countries have such difficulty investing in the Islamic Republic. When we look at a lot of the hostages that were seized, 
the most recent batch of Iranian Americans, for example. Many of those were Iranian Americans who opposed sanctions. They went, they sought to do business in Iran, they ran afoul of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps companies, and that's why they ended up being taken hostage. The issue with many of these companies is they literally control 40% of the Iranian economy. They're very legitimate companies. Now, this is the reason why we have the debate within the United States, for example, about whether we should just designate the Quds Force, which is the tip of the spear, the militant group that tries to export revolution abroad, or designate as terrorists the entire Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. So at home, the IRGC can be in charge of anything from making cars to owning pharmaceutical supply lines, making it somewhat difficult to completely designate the entire IRGC as a terrorist organization. But abroad, they'll often be the ones carrying out Iranian foreign policy objectives. A classic example here being the IRGC support for the Houthi movement in Yemen, the group currently fighting off the Saudi Arabian invasion of the country. So what would be the IRGC motive and method for getting involved in the country here? I used to live in Yemen, and in Sada were the Houthis or the Zaydis. The Houthis are the tribal name. It's the same as the Zaydis, which are really five or Shiites. The five or Shiites are theologically about as close to Sunnis as you can be without actually being Sunnis. Now, here's the thing. We think of Iran and the Islamic uh, Revolutionary Guard Corps as a Shiite force. But from an Iranian point of view, they're an Islamic force. And while we look at the Shia as having broken away from the Sunnis, from the Iranian perspective, the Sunnis broke away from the Shia. And this is one of the reasons why the Shia have no problem going after the Fivers in Yemen, even though they're not the same type of, of um, Shia, let alone working with the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. So with that being the case, how does this play out in countries like Afghanistan to Iran's east, where Iran has been pretty open about their preference for Afghanistan to maintain a far more secular government than what they probably have at the moment, even demonstrating this through their open support of the US-backed Karzai administration in the past? So are the IIGC's preferences more about geopolitics or religion or secularism? What drives the IRGC's policy decisions here? There's this concept of Iran Zamin, basically the historical greater Iran, the, the old Persian Empire. And of course, that included uh, parts of Afghanistan as well. Persian was the lingua franca from Burma all the way into Iraq. It was the language of the elite, a language of literature, the language of instruction and so forth. And so Afghan Dari in the Afghan dialect is basically just a dialect of, of Persian. So the Iranians will justify themselves that way. And of course, you have Shiism and the Hazara in the interior of Afghanistan. So Afghanistan checks all three boxes for the Iranians to justify their action there. But why do they want a secular government? It's the same reason they don't want an Ayatollah in power in Baghdad. They don't want competition. The supreme leader of Iran is technically the deputy of the Messiah on earth until the hidden Imam returns. If you have another Ayatollah in power, that's competition. And while Ayatollah Khomeini, the leader of the Islamic Revolution in 1979, had great religious legitimacy, the current leader of Iran, Ali Khamenei, never reached that level. In 1994, he tried to assert it, and he was laughed off the stage. If I can just go for Iraq for a second, the most popular Ayatollah in Iraq is Grand Ayatollah Ali Sistani. The most popular Ayatollah in Iran is Grand Ayatollah Ali Sistani. And we know that because Shiites have to pay what's called khums, one fifth of their income after they've taken care of all their other expenses in order to support whichever Ayatollah they want to pay allegiance to. They vote with their wallet, so to speak. And it's led to a lack of self-confidence. One of the reasons why we have the Revolutionary Guard interfering in Iraq or Afghanistan isn't because they just wanted to kill Americans or Australians or Brits who were on the ground there. It's because they wanted to silence the other ayatollahs who could be competition. When I worked in the Pentagon, one of the first big things we had to worry about in Iraq now was something called Arba'in, which is the 40th day anniversary after the martyrdom of Imam Hussein. And in Iraq, it's marked by a pilgrimage of millions of people walking basically from Baghdad to Nejef. Now, in Islam, like Judaism, months begin and end with the sighting of the new moon. And so the Ayatollah in Iran said it's going to be Wednesday. But for the first time, Iranian journalists could go to Sistani because Saddam Hussein was gone. And they asked him and he said, it's Tuesday, 
well, how the heck can you be the supreme leader of Iran with ultimate political and religious authority and get contradicted by someone else? That's why they oftentimes put these militias both in Iraq and, for that matter, in Afghanistan as well. Okay, then, so who actually holds the power? If I wanted to negotiate on foreign policy issues in Iran, should I be talking to the Iranian Foreign Office, who's picked by the civilian government, or should I be talking to the IRGC, who's picked by the theocratic one? The first thing to realize is that when you look at the Iranian diplomatic corps, the countries which Iran considers to be most important to it don't have an ordinary diplomat as their ambassador. So in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Lebanon, and in Syria, you will always have a member of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, and more specifically, you're going to have a member of the Quds Force, that elite unit of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps acting as ambassador. And so in some of these countries also where the Iranians are supporting special groups, militias, and so forth, it makes sense to have a guy from the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps as ambassador because if your main goal is to smuggle in explosively formed projectiles, you want someone who knows what the heck they're doing. That said, oftentimes the foreign ministers will retire in order to become special advisors to the supreme leader. And so that's another way in which the Iranians will ensure that the security aspect of their foreign policy, the religious aspect of their foreign policy, is put first and foremost. The other thing to understand about Iran, when it comes to the formulation of Western strategy, we could trace it from Machiavelli on up. Back in the 11th century, there's a guy named Nizam al-Mulk, who was an Iranian grand vizier, basically a prime minister. And he wrote a book called the Siyasat Nameh, the Book of Policy, the Book of Governance. And what he argued to the king was, if you want to keep control, what you have to do is not streamline the security services. You've got to duplicate them. Because when you duplicate different security services, then you can have them compete with each other. You can have them inform on each other. And you can control them by either offering or withdrawing money from each other. So from an American mindset, if we try to project our own structure onto Iran, we're going to miss it every single time. The reason I bring this up in answer to your question is, so who's in charge of policy towards Saudi Arabia? Is it the foreign minister? Or is it the special advisor to the supreme leader? Or is it the head of the Quds Force? The answer to that is it could be all three at different times. And it also gives Iran an ability to have plausible deniability should an operation go awry. How many times have we seen that Iranians do something and diplomats, whether it's in Australia or the United States, will say, we can't hold Iran accountable to this. It was just a rogue action on the part of some commander. The fact of the matter is, that's by design. And how far does this mandate actually extend? You know, we know for a fact that the IRGC operate right across the Middle East, but now increasingly they're getting more involved in places like South America and Africa, even opening up the possibility of establishing an IRGC naval base in Eritrea, near the Red Sea's choke point near the Bebel Armand, an area that acts as the lead-in into the Suez Canal. So if the IRGC are operating right across the globe, where are the boundaries of their jurisdiction here? Up until around 2011, the Iranians used to define themselves as a regional power, meaning the Persian Gulf. Then after around 2011, they started talking about themselves as a pan-regional power, meaning the Persian Gulf and the Northern Indian Ocean. Subsequent to that, they defined their strategic boundaries as the Eastern Mediterranean and the Gulf of Aden. So basically that means from Syria down through the Suez Canal to the Red Sea. So the Iranian military, especially the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, has been very, very forthright about this. And part of that, again, goes back to the ancient Persian Empire and what they see as their near abroad. And when I've heard the president of Iran speak, Ibrahim Raisi, he will oftentimes say, Iran, this is Iran's area. No one else has any reason to actually be here. It's sort of like an Iranian Monroe doctrine. Now, we know that only about 10 or 15% of Iranians truly believe in the Islamic Republic. Iranians culturally will talk. They don't respond to polls the way Afghans or Iraqis do, which is basically just telling you what you want to hear or telling you what would get you things, especially when it comes to economic questions. So we will survey them doing cold calls on mostly economic questions. And when you do the statistical analysis and number crunching, you find that 10% of Iranians truly believe 
in the Islamic Republic. They think what Khomeini is doing is great. These are the so-called hardliners. Another 15% think that, you know, the Islamic Revolution was a good idea. It's been misapplied. We need reform. These are the so-called reformers. The other 75% have given up completely on the system. They're not revolutionary. They're apathetic. There's an old joke Iranians used to tell about an Iranian woman who's getting married on her wedding night tells her husband, you know, I probably should have told you this before, but but this is my second marriage. And the husband goes, what? And she said, no, 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 don't worry, I'm still a virgin. And he says, how can that be? And she says, well, my first husband was like Hassan Rouhani, the former president. He kept promising to do it, promising to do it, promising to do it. And after eight years, he didn't touch a thing. Well, only 10 or 25 percent of Iranians believe in the Islamic revolution and this theory of government, which Khomeini put down. At least 90 percent of Iranians are fiercely nationalistic. And when their economy is collapsing, not because of sanctions, but because of mismanagement, the best strategy they have to hold their country together is to rally people around the flag. And that can mean creating some sort of nationalist crisis somewhere in their zone of influence. So in the Gulf of Aden, in Lebanon, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, around which they can try to rally the nationalism of the Iranian people. Now, for objectivity here, I will point out that Whilst 15% approval of the government is remarkably low, for context, when US citizens are polled about their approval of Congress, Congress receives an approval rating of just 17%. But pushing that aside, if we were to take the scenario and play it out a bit further, and suggest that hypothetically the US were to follow through on some threats made by previous administrations, and they carry out an invasion of Iran under that mandate that, well, the government only has 15% approval, and that the US is just here to liberate them from a bad government, how would you envision the Iranian general public responding to a U.S. intervention against a government that they widely disapprove of? It would galvanize the general public against the invading force. It would be a huge mistake to utilize military action against Iran. Look, Steve Erlinger, who rose to become the chief foreign correspondent of the New York Times, wrote a piece for the New Republic when he was still a young Boston Globe reporter that came out one day before the embassy seizure back in November 1979. The piece in the New Republic was about, written from Iran, was about how the religious angle, the religious aspect of the Islamic revolution has worn itself out, that Iran is going to come back from the cold, and this period of time, this year, is going to be behind us. The crisis of the embassy seizure, followed by Saddam Hussein's invasion of Iran, was what saved the Islamic revolution. And simply put, had Saddam Hussein not invaded Iran, Iran would have been a normal republic today. Unfortunately, during that eight years of crisis, they allowed the Iranian government, Khomeini's government, followed and the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps to really consolidate power in a way they hadn't been able before. I wouldn't want to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory twice. Now, Iran has been a fiercely nationalistic country for years now, often touting a doctrine of self-reliance and independent strength. So why is it that we're seeing Tehran refocusing their foreign policy and entering into more talks with outside powers, making moves such as somewhat normalizing relations with the Saudis, major trade deals with Russia, and even joining the China-led BRICS organization? What do these more diplomatically outward-facing moves tell us about Iranian foreign policy going forward? When we look at the history of how Iran approaches the world, who built the modern Iranian army? It was actually the Austro-Hungarians in the 1850s. And then the Iranians turned to the Belgians in the first decade of the 20th century, sort of as balance against the Russians and the British. That didn't work. And that's when the Americans got involved. And the, they embraced the Americans because we had no sort of broader global imperial or diplomatic interest. Obviously, they made a mistake there, and so it's this traditional Iranian xenophobia is not going to let them make the same mistake five or six times, so they're going to keep China at bay. What's actually interesting is the Russia relationship, because it's been 500 years since Russia and Iran were so close. And while Ayatollah Khamenei reaches out to the Iranians, and we see the dealings, for example, with regard to the drones with Ukraine and so forth, when you actually look at ordinary Iranians... They are aghast at the Russians. There is one episode with the Syrian civil war where the Russians actually launched missiles from inside Iran at opposition targets in Syria. And when the Iranians found out about it, 
ordinary Iranians went ballistic. Iran's no democracy, but the pressure was such that they had to lock the Russians down on their base and say, don't you ever do this again. It will be interesting to see how that relationship develops. But that said, they're going to want to sort of balance the great powers against each other, but they don't want to put themselves in a position where they are going to be dominated by any of them. So Iran not only has serious factors pushing upon the country from every side externally, but also massive factors pushing on it from within as well, with the civilian government, the armed forces, and the IRGC all out to shepherd the national trajectory of Iran in a manner that is most beneficial to them, whether that be putting the economy first, foreign policy first, or the Ayatollah first. There seems to be an ongoing power struggle from within Iran. And whilst we've just seen how that plays out across Iran's eastern axis, how does it play out across Iran's western one? In countries like Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Turkey, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and more importantly now, Russia. Well, to answer that, we turn to our second guest. Part two, the wager in the West. The Iranian regime believes that it is moving in the right direction, that it is stronger today in the region than ever before. And a lot of uh, folks in Washington believe that too. Iran is doing well in Lebanon. It's a key political partner for the Assad regime in Syria. It is a key backer of the Houthi movement in Yemen. And obviously Iran is arguably the most powerful political actor in the country of Iraq today. So you put these countries together, you you get a list that's decent size and Iran can say, well, look, this is because of our hard work the last 10 years and we're in the region. We are forced to be reckoned with. They've tried, they meaning the West, to sanction us, to, to cut our wings and they haven't succeeded because look, the evidence speaks for itself. The question for leadership in Tehran is, do you wanna own these crises, these problems? Do you have the money, for example, to pay for the reconstruction of a country like Syria or Yemen? And the answer to that is they don't have the money because they have plenty of problems inside of Iran. Alex Vitanka is the director of the Iran program at the Middle East Institute. Born in Tehran, he was formerly a senior analyst at the Jane's Information Group in London, as well as a senior fellow in Middle East Studies at the US Air Force Special Operations School at Halbert Field. In addition to this, he also taught as an adjunct professor at the DISAS Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and has testified before multiple bodies, including the US Departments of State, Defense, and Intelligence Agencies. And in addition to that, he's also the author of many well-renowned books on the subject of Iranian politics, the most recent one being The Battle of the Ayatollahs in Iran. But more importantly, we're thrilled to have him on the program today. We've heard now for over a decade about this Shia crescent. It's a nice, catchy soundbite. It looks good on the map because it makes sense. You can see that bridge from Iran all the way to the Mediterranean. But obviously, as everything in politics and international relations, it's a heck of a lot more complicated than that. Iran didn't help Assad in Syria because President Assad is a good Shia or a good Muslim or Islamist. He's none of those things. The fact that Iran went to Syria's aid back in 2012-13 and has invested so heavily is no different than why the Russians got involved in Syria in 2015. President Putin isn't a Muslim or an Islamist. He's not part of a Shia crescent. It's part of geopolitics. They didn't want to see an ally, in this case Assad, fall. Because if he fell, a pro-American, a pro-Western, or a pro-Saudi, pro-Emirati, somebody closer to the West than to Iran or Russia, would take over in Damascus. And that was seen as a net loss for the likes of Ayatollah Ali Khamenei in Tehran or President Vladimir Putin in Russia. So that's why they came together. And I think to some extent, you can say the same is true in Yemen. I mean, the idea that the Yemeni Houthi movement is Shia and is part of the Shia crescent, it gets oversimplification. The Houthis are not 12 or Shias. They have problems uh, with Iran's geopolitical rival, uh, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and that's why the Iranians got involved. They were helping the Houthis in in order to advance their geopolitical interest in the region. In in fact, I would say anti-Americanism and anti-Western sentiment is much more of a logical way to look at how Iran has been able to put together a coalition of sorts from Hezbollah in Lebanon, to Hamas among the Palestinians, to the Houthis, to the proxy groups in Iraq, terrorism. Sectarianism is convenient at times. In the case of Iraq, it was certainly uh, convenient to use to mobilize Iraqi Shias when the United States invaded back in 
2003. And it has obviously worked out quite well in places like Lebanon. But when it's not useful, then the Iranians will use another vehicle to promote their interests. So, yes, the Shia Crescent argument, to some extent, it's easy for us to sort of divide the Middle East into spheres of influence and, and a geopolitical clash that's been going on. But we have to be careful to not fall into too much of over, oversimplifying the, the various factors. So if it is geopolitics that forms Iran's reasons for being so involved in Syria, what is the overall end game when it comes to this campaign? You know, you ask a very important question. What is the end mission for Iran in Syria? I mean, it's not economics. Iran hasn't made any money in Syria. In fact, Syria has been a bit of a black hole. Iran keeps throwing money it barely has into this black hole to sustain the regime of, of President Assad. And plenty of Iranians will point out and say, what are we getting for all this investment? Never mind the money. There are a few hundreds of Iranian special forces and others that have gone to Syria to fight for Assad. To what end? Uh, I think most analysts would probably argue the one thing that makes sense in terms of why Iran has invested so uh, heavily in Syria at this great cost, it's because it sees Syria as essential part of its campaign against the state of Israel. Because how do you supply Hezbollah, the Shia political movement? How do you supply them with military hardware? I mean, remember, in this Iranian-Israeli fight, Hezbollah plays a pivotal role. Hezbollah is that Iranian ability to project power over Israel in the event that Iran needs to use them against Israel. Now, to get all those missiles to Hezbollah in Lebanon, Iran has over the years depended greatly on Syria being a facilitator. This explains why the Israelis have over the years attacked so many of these Iranian supply deliveries on Syrian soil. Uh, and again, that's what a lot of Iranian regime figures have in over the years pretty much openly said. But the folks that run Iran today, and I think there are two components that are most important, the office of the Supreme Leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, and his inner circle, and the generals in the Revolutionary Guards, they are committed to Syria. And they don't care what the foreign minister says, they don't even care what the presidential palace says, or Iranian public opinion. They're committed to this campaign in Syria, and very clearly willing to pay a very high price to be there. Well, if maintaining these supply and projection corridors across Syria into Lebanon and toward the borders of Israel is part of the overall Iranian strategy in Syria, how true do you think the speculation is that Iran would eventually use these corridors to launch a ground campaign into Israel? I think the last thing the Iranian regime wants to do is to get involved in a military conflict with anybody. And certainly there is zero public opinion inside of Iran, except the Revolutionary Guards and maybe Khamenei. But I would actually say even Revolutionary Guards and Khamenei are not stupid enough to want to send ground forces. There's a reason why they haven't sent conscript soldiers, i.e. 18-year-olds, to, to Syria over the last 10, 12 years. They only send volunteers to Syria. There's a very simple reason for that. You start sending conscript Iranian boys, age of 18, to die in a faraway land in Syria, you got to look their moms and dads in the eye and say why they died. And Khamenei and the Revolution Guards know they don't have a good answer for that. And they know they already are sitting on powder keg of sorts. I mean, Iran is a very angry society today. They're dealing with protests on a frequent basis. Iranian public opinion is not a fan of this Iranian regime. And the Iranian regime right now has an 84-year-old supreme leader who might die at any moment. And when he dies, what the regime really needs is maximum stability at home in order to have a successful transition to the next leader. If they are distracted by a war, that is the opposite of stability. So for, for those reasons, yes, Iran and Iranian leaders daily huff and puff about how Israel is about to decline and fall away. But what they never say is that they are going to be the ones who take on that war directly. Instead, what they do is they try and empower groups like Hamas, Palestinian Jihad, Hezbollah. It's a war through proxy. Iran can try and do that because there's always an element of deniability. Now, we're recording this episode just a few days after there have been massive events taking place in the South Caucasus, with Azerbaijan occupying the area of Nagorno-Karabakh. 
Now, we've already done two full episodes on Nagorno-Karabakh and the situation between Armenia and Azerbaijan, so if you want to understand the history, go check those out. But as an update to those pieces of what's recently happened, in short, there was an area of UN-recognized Azerbaijan that was almost universally populated by ethnic Armenians, who have lived there and maintained their sovereignty against Azerbaijan and whose government and armed forces were supported by Armenia proper. However, in 2020, the Uzeris, with the help of Turkey and Israel, made a large offensive in the pocket, occupying the areas surrounding it and squeezing the ethnic Armenian's population down to a small pocket around a few key cities, with Russia eventually stepping in to maintain the Lachin Corridor, the one road in and out of the pocket. Now, fast forward a couple of years, and Russia is somewhat distracted elsewhere at the moment. And so, Azeri climate protesters would move into the Lachin Corridor and blockade the one highway between the pocket and Armenia proper. Fast forward to this month, and the Azeris have used their military to completely occupy and remove the pocket. And the ethnic Armenians living there have now almost universally been pushed out or have fled, fearing persecution by Azerbaijan. Which, that brings us to today, and why this matters to Iran. Now, if you don't spend as much time looking at maps as I do, you may not be aware of some of the oddities of the Caucasus nation's borders, and why this would matter so much to Tehran. Now, obviously, for just mental visualization purposes, I want you to imagine five vertical rectangles standing next to one another, labeled one to five, left to right. Now, from left to right, rectangle one, that one represents the eastern border of Turkey. The second rectangle, being Nachivan, is an exclave of Azerbaijan, sovereign to Baku, but separated from the rest of the country. The third rectangle, the middle one, would represent the Republic of Armenia. And moving to the right, the fourth rectangle would be the Republic of Azerbaijan. And the fifth to the right of that would be the Caspian Sea, with Iran sitting along the bottom edge of all five rectangles, and Georgia and Russia sitting along the top edge of these five rectangles. So hold on to that image in your mind. Now, since Armenia and Azerbaijan have disliked each other to an almost unfathomable capacity for quite some time now, the borders have been closed, and therefore very little trade goes along any corridors that run from left to right. But Azerbaijan, who effectively is the little brother to Turkey, has wanted to open up corridors connecting its Rectangle 4 to its exclave in Rectangle 2 and Turkey in Rectangle 1. And Turkey has always wanted to connect itself with Azerbaijan as well as the Caspian Sea. But Armenia in Rectangle 3 has always stood in the way of any plans of corridor here. Now the corridor we're talking about in real life is known as the Zangazor Corridor, and it's about 20 miles from east to west, and is currently a source of major geopolitical tension in this region of the world. Now a little while back when Azerbaijan was making rumblings about occupying this corridor, and since the Russians were distracted, Iran was the one that stepped up to support the Armenians, seeing as Turkey and Israel were supporting the Azeris doing so by moving its troops and supplies up to the border with Armenia and Azerbaijan, and threatening to back Armenia in a war if the Azeris made the push into UN recognized Armenia in an effort to secure the Zangazor Corridor. Now they did this hoping to maintain its direct border with Armenia, as it would lose its border with Armenia if the Zangazor Corridor were occupied by Azerbaijan. Armenia being an important trade route for Iran, as it's the main highway that connects Iran to Georgia and therefore Russia. Now at the time, the Iranians made a big stink about this, and the Azeris ended up backing down. The tension subsided, and Iran came away a little more confident. But now though, the tension seems to be rapidly escalating again, with Azeri motorized troops now poised along the jumping off point near the Zangazor Corridor, and Turkish President Erdogan making appearances in Nachivan, Rectangle 2 in our analogy, talking about the benefits of an Azerbaijan-Turkey corridor. And many are wondering if now that Azerbaijan has closed the pocket around Nagorno-Karabakh, if they might use those freed up troops to actually make the push they've been threatening for years now. So apart from a direct round into Russia, why is Iran so invested in this region of the world, and how likely is it that they would end up actually engaging in conflict with Azerbaijan, noting the large Azeri populations within Iran itself? Iran keeps being surprised about developments in the South Caucasus and the conflict between the Republic of Azerbaijan and Armenia. Unfortunately for Iran, they've been so distracted and invested in the Arab world that they kind of forgot that there is this region to their north called the South Caucasus, which is actually strategically important for Iranian national interests for a number of reasons. Among those reasons, one is Iran has repeatedly lost out in terms of economic projects that have happened in the South Caucasus. Because of Western pressure, countries like Azerbaijan, Georgia to some extent, have avoided dealing with Iran economically. That has been a net loss for Iran since the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. 
Now there is talk of Baku trying to, again, engage in a new transport corridor from Republic of Azerbaijan proper through Armenian land in the Republic of Armenia to connect to Turkey. This Zangazur corridor is something that Iran has opposed because it sees it as a been bypassed by it. But the other thing is Zangazur would essentially, if it happened by force, would mean the loss of Iran having a physical land border with the Republic of Armenia. And ironically, Christian Armenia is the one neighbor among Iran's 15 neighbors that Iran has had the best relations with, going back to when Armenia was born in modern times in 1991. So the Iranians do want to remain close with Armenia. They do appreciate having that land border. And they're worried that Zangazur would deprive them from having that land border and, and being separated from, from Christian Armenia. But there are obviously other actors, principally Turkey, Russia. And in recent years, we've seen increasingly the presence of Israel in the South Caucasus. So for the Iranians, and this is the second part of, of why this equation is sensitive for, for Iran, the nightmare scenario for Iran is that Israel does in South Caucasus, in Azerbaijan, what Iran has done in South Lebanon to Israel, which is to turn it into a springboard, a launch pad of sorts for its operations. Now, the Azeris have not allowed the state of Israel deploying strategic military capabilities, their soil, with the aim of targeting inside of Iran. But that could change. And that's something that Iran would have good reasons to fear because suddenly Israel from goes from being a country that's five, six, seven hundred miles away to a country that sits right there with its military presence in the Republic of Azerbaijan. And the Israelis could use a presence, maybe together with the Turks, to incite that large ir- Iranian ethnic Azerbaijani population that lives in Iran to basically rise up against Khamenei and the regime in Tehran. So Playing the separatist card, the ethnic card, when it comes to Iranian Azeris, is something that the regime in Tehran also fears. Because remember, the numbers are great. There are twice as many ethnic Azerbaijanis living in Iran that lives in the Republic of Azerbaijan. And the Iranians have always, going back centuries, feared foreign plots to essentially split the country into smaller ethnic regions. So This is no longer just an issue of economic losses because of what's happening in the South Caucasus, but the South Caucasus is becoming a source for Iranian national territorial integrity coming under question. And that that is a sort of fear the Iranians have always had, and I think increasingly so today than before, because the Republic of Azerbaijan has been in the ascendancy, and now we have to see what Baku's next step will be vis-a-vis Iran, and vis-a-vis its cooperation with Turkey and Israel. So what is the response if the Azeris choose to go through with their operation to capture Zangazor and occupy part of the Republic of Armenia? If the Azeris went into the Republic of Armenia, then the war between Armenia and Azerbaijan would have entered a phase we haven't seen before. Because remember, in, since 91, Azerbaijan has been claiming its lands that by international law were Azerbaijani lands. If Baku now decides to push ahead and by force capture lands that are Armenian lands, belong to the Republic of Armenia, we have then entered a phase and a new reality that I can't predict. Again, if Azerbaijan did take Zangazur by force, we have entered a new phase. I don't know how different regional and global powers, including the United States, would act. But when it comes to Iran, at this very moment, the Iranians will probably do is to support Armenian military to the extent possible to push back against the Azeris, but without attacking or engaging our Azerbaijan directly themselves. Remember, again, this isn't just a war between Iran and a foreign country, a neighbor. This is a war where suddenly officials in Tehran have to fight a country, in this case Azerbaijan, that has 20 million plus inside of Iran's border. So the question then becomes, what happens to Iranian ethnic Azeri sentiment? Would they suddenly choose to support their cousins to the north in Baku against Tehran or not? 
And obviously this becomes infinitely more complicated when you start adding Turkey, a NATO member into the mix. So noting that Erdogan's been giving speeches in the area, how do you think this will impact future relations between Ankara and Tehran? Iran and Turkey relations going back to 79, when the Islamists took power in Tehran, has had many ups and downs. And I think we will continue to see ups and downs. Essentially, what I detect to be the case is that they're happy to have this periodic tensions in relations, including, as we discussed earlier, competing for influence in, in not just Syria, but also in the South Caucasus, in Lebanon, we see Iranian-Turkish competition for influence even among the Gulf states, countries like Qatar, UAE, and Saudi Arabia. So this Iranian-Turkish competition has always been there. It's kind of natural. Sometimes it becomes more where it could get out of hand, but the fact is it's never gotten out of hand. You've never had Iranian and, and Turkish guns really pointed at each other since 1970. Certainly, President Erdogan has at times provoked the Iranians on the issue of the Iranian Azeri ethnic community. He often talks about their rights being trampled on. So it kind of hints at Turkish support for the Turkic speaking Azeri minority in Iran. But then, you know, just this week, he talked about if Zangazur doesn't happen from Azerbaijan to Turkey, then maybe that transport corridor, instead of going through Armenia, could go through Iran. So that is a suggestion that he knows how sensitive this issue is for the Iranians. Both of them can find ways to hurt each other. If you go back to the nasty 1980s, for example, the Iranians were supporting militant Kurdish groups that operated in Turkey at the time. They stopped doing that. They can do that again in retaliation, depending on what Turkey does to them. So there's a recognition, both in Ankara and Tehran, that they can hurt each other in ways that once that fight is over and the dust settles, that both of them recognize they're both weaker for it. Iran putting troops and weapons into Armenia would likely raise some eyebrows in Russia and China, as Armenia is part of the CSTO, a Russian version of NATO, making all of the lines around this issue even more blurry. So how will this saber-rattling impact Tehran's relations with not only themselves and Moscow, but also between themselves and another nation increasingly interested in the Caucasus, China? What lies ahead for the relations between those guys? Iran's foreign policy is proudly described by the leadership, by the Islamist leadership in Tehran as a revolutionary one. And the sort of at the heart of this revolutionary foreign policy has been this wish, if you will, to confront what they call imperialist powers, by which they mean Western powers, principally the United States. Just listen to the speech that President Ibrahim Raisi gave to the United Nations General Assembly. I mean, if you listen to the 36 minute of remarks, you see the legacy of the 1979 revolution, this desire to end Western domination of the international order. And if that's what you subscribe to, then you really have no option but to move closer to the likes of Russia and China. Iran recently was offered membership in BRICS, this block of nations led by Russia and China that are supposed to be a counterweight to the likes of Western powers. Now, two of Iran's neighbors were also offered at the same time membership in BRICS, UAE and, and Saudi Arabia. I bet you that Iranian analysts who are skeptical about their re- government's performance when it comes to international relations would point out that when Iran got the membership offer into BRICS, it was overjoyed because it just helps them to break this notion that they're isolated. And they were not in a position to say, thank you for the offer, but no thanks. But guess who could say no thanks? It's Iran's neighbors like Saudi Arabia and UAE, because unlike Iran, they are not beholden to China and Russia. They can play the China card, and they are, the Russia card, and they are, but they can also turn to the United States if they are offered enough attractive deals. For example, within days of Saudi Arabia being offered membership in BRICS, reports tell us that the Biden administration, the Saudis were talking about a potential defense pact. And that's, I think, is a reflection of where the countries like Saudi Arabia are. They're flexible. They have options. Whereas Iran's ideological shaped foreign policy limits it. So it's engaging in this extremely costly back and forth fight with the West over its nuclear program now for over 20 years. This is a country that if was pursuing economic goals, if the way some of its neighbors do, Iran could be a top 20 economy in the world. 
And that's not where they are today because their economy is in, in, in being taken hostage by their foreign policy. So Iran is seemingly standing next to the possibility of war, a war against Azerbaijan, who has a much more technically equipped army, whilst also enjoying the backing of Israel and Turkey. But we probably need to take a step back and take a look at what warfighting capacity Iran has left. As whilst, yes, they do have a large military and an impressive indigenous defense production sector, they're also currently stretching their resources across three branches of the military. And engagements in Yemen, Africa, South America, Lebanon, Syria, Yemen, and Iraq, as well as along its land borders with Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Turkmenistan, and its maritime borders along the Persian Gulf and its operational areas in the Red Sea. And on top of all that, they also have to station troops across the country internally against their own people to hold everything back down in place. And as a small cherry on top of this situation, Russia has also been buying up more and more of their munitions and stock for Moscow to use in its war against Ukraine. So the ammunition has been going down, whilst operations still maintain capacity across Iran's strategic goals. So what capacity does Iran have left at the moment? What is it prioritizing in its production? And now that foreign capital is flowing in from Russia, will Rouhani's claims that Iran will have a defense export sector to rival that of China's finally actually come true? Well, to answer that, we'll turn to our final guest. Part 3. The Necessity in the North Well, it is a matter of fact that IRGC and its now fully integrated besiege or popular mobilization force component receives a substantially larger share of the annual military budget compared to the budget of the National Armed Forces, or Artesh. As a rule of thumb, it is almost twice as high, if not more. But when we want to translate it into quality and quantity of military equipment actually delivered to the operational units of the IRGC and Artesh, it is a slightly more complex issue. Fazan Nadimi is a senior fellow at the Washington Institute, specializing in the security and defense affairs of Iran and the Persian Gulf. He's written numerous papers and analysis pieces on the state of the Iranian military capacity and is one of the go-to sources for details and analysis on the state's warfighting capabilities. And we're thrilled to have him on the program today. The IRGC units are mainly based inland and near major population areas with an eye on the population too. But they also are involved in day-to-day -day territorial missions as well, like patrolling the maritime borders in the south. The quality of IRGC and Artesh armor and mechanized equipment are more or less the same. But Iran's National Navy has their more strategic role of protecting the shipping routes beyond the Strait of Hormuz with heavier warships and submarines. And the IRGC controls the Strait and the Persian Gulf using small speedboats and shore batteries. However, that said, the IRGC too has been arming itself recently with larger sea-basing ships and missile corvettes and even small to medium-sized submarines, which shows they have more ambitious objectives in the long term. With regard to the air defense capabilities, the two are more or less the same. Although the Artesh is broadly responsible for the air defense mission, but there is a Khatam al Ambiya headquarter in place that oversees, or should oversee, both the IRGC and Artesh air defense uh, forces and capabilities. Now, for an armed force with the size and budget of Iran's, the end result is quite an odd make of hodgepodge bits of equipment and a seeming endless raft of contradictions. As an example, it has a whole bunch of pretty capable ballistic missile and rocket artillery launchers, but at the same time also has some of the oldest tank stocks in the field, with the majority of Iran's armored forces still made up of old Soviet T-72s or British chieftain tanks from the 1960s that they acquired before the revolution. So how is Iran attempting to fix these inadequacies built within their army at the moment? Iran has worked on reorganizing its armed forces in the, in the last decade and changed its strategy of traditional heavy division-based doctrine into much more mobile and deployable brigade-level structure. The IRGC has also integrated the besiege structure, and now we have IRGC divisions and brigades integrated with uh, battalions 
uh, the besiege force or the mobilization forces, and uh, they have better equipment for those special operations or a special purpose besiege units. And some of those units have been trained to fight high intensity wars with foreign enemies. Some of them have unfortunately been trained for anti-riot and uh, counterinsurgency operations, which means they are trained to fight their own people, to deter popular unrests, and, but if necessary, to use lethal force. What Iran is becoming increasingly famous for, though, is its Shahid drones, which Russia has been buying as well as setting up facilities for mass reproduction of at the moment, as they've proven to be invaluable for the Russians in their war in Ukraine. So Iran is punching well above its own weight in value for money drones, whilst at the same time falling way behind in its conventional air force, with Iranian air forces operating some of the oldest planes anywhere in the world, with the air force operating just a handful of pretty worn out MiG-29s and Su-22s, whilst still relying on an operational backbone of Frankenstein US F-4 Phantoms, which saw most of their service during the Vietnam War, US F-5 Tigers, which were introduced during the early 60s, and F-14 Tomcats, to which the US retired their last Tomcat almost 20 years ago. So why is Iran choosing to throw its weight behind these drone programs rather than upgrading the domestic air force stock? Iran's projection capabilities have increased considerably during the last decade. And ever since Iran tested its Shahab tree missile almost 20 years ago, mainly expanded during the last two decades, to be more accurate, the kits that can be shipped to its proxies and allies in the region, like the Houthis in Yemen and the Hezbollah in Lebanon, and convert their unguided rockets into precision. And this has also been a major source of concern for Iran's adversaries in the region, especially Israel. So Iran improved its accuracy. Iran uh, also increase the capabilities of its solid propellant and missile technologies. So having said that, Iran's production capability has still been limited compared to the demand of a country like Russia, which is involved in high-intensity warfare. But that has resulted in Iran's move to send drones from its own stocks into Russia. But can you take us through why Iran would focus on building up this drone program rather than refitting their very old air force? Well, the design, development, and production of manned aircraft takes much longer and is much more expensive compared to UAVs and requires even more for sourced components, which are hard to come by under sanctions. On the other hand, basing, operating, and maintaining drones are much easier and cheaper compared to manned aircraft. Drones also fit very well in Iran's asymmetric warfare doctrine and their effects-based operational doctrine. But having said that, Iran has been trying to purchase aircraft from Russia and should be expected to continue doing so. So what is the main role of the Iranian Air Force at the moment? As obviously going toe-to-toe with someone like Turkey or Saudi Arabia with some of the latest generation aircraft, it would be almost a no contest. So what is the role of the Iranian Air Force at the moment? So the IRIF or the Artesh Air Force has been by far the larger and more capable service in terms of aviation. And its main role is to defend Iran against foreign enemies. To this end, it operates around 100 aircraft. They have been good at maintaining these aircraft, at keeping them uh, flying by finding parts for them, or when they cannot find the parts for them in the international black market, they manage to fabricate them back home in their aviation industries, which, by the way, have been formed before the revolution, mostly by the U.S. aerospace giants like Boeing, like Lockheed and Grumman. If we take a look back on the ground, though, the story isn't much better there either, as when it comes to the tanks in particular, Iranian heavy armor is woefully out of date and in very low numbers. For an idea of just how bad it is, they possess around 600 main battle tanks for an army of around 600,000 soldiers, with most of those tanks being produced in the 1960s and 70s. And whilst they do have slightly more capacity to build indigenous APCs or armored personnel carriers, it's still nowhere near enough from what you'd expect in an army that's usually ranked 7th or 8th in military capacity. So based on this, what sort of power projections do you actually see Iran possessing? If they wanted to, for the sake of the argument, go for a full-scale invasion of Azerbaijan, how far would you expect they get? 
But the simple answer is no, Iran does not have a capability to launch and support a land invasion of a neighboring country. However, it has a large arsenal of accurate ballistic missiles and suicide drones that can be utilized as a long-range hover projection tool. If, for example, it wants to deter Azerbaijani forces from entering the Armenian territory in order to secure a land corridor to Nakhchivan, Iran probably doesn't need to launch land invasion, but they all they need to do is to deploy limited number of special operations IRGC forces supported by Iranian Air Force and Air Defense Forces. So mainly their focus will be on deterrence to prevent a need for a major land war. Saying that though Iran's defense production capabilities have been rapidly rising over the last few years, with Rouhani making the claim that their production is now 100 times larger than it was in 2013. Now, even if that's vastly overshooting it or fudging the numbers by making some claims on what counts as a unit, there is a certainty that there is a bunch of Russian foreign capital now entering this market in Iran, with Moscow just signing a deal with the Iranians to build large industrial-scale drone factories, making effectively knockoff Shahed drones in facilities throughout Dagestan in the south of Russia. Which, if it goes ahead, will see the price of Shahed's drop even further than it already has, which in turn is likely to make it even more attractive to a number of other nations' armed forces. So do you think this is the beginning of a new golden age of Iranian defense production that may even, as they claim, be able to rival China for defense exports within the next decade or so? Iran has been doing very well in areas such as short to medium range ballistic missiles, cruise and anti-ship missiles, and drones with products comparable in quality to those of China. But in many other areas, such as aircraft and space industry, they have a long way to go. In the next decade, we will see much more capable Iranian drone and ballistic missile capability with ranges exceeding 4,000 kilometers with hypersonic speeds in terms of ballistic missiles and a satellite launch capability that can take a mid-sized satellite to the 1,000 kilometer orbit. Iranian drones will be larger, more capable of carrying ordnance, and they will be most likely have the capability to use satellite data links in order to increase their range and endurance. We'll develop air defense systems capable of intercepting targets as far away as 400 kilometers, and perhaps even an anti-ballistic missile capability will be fielded in, uh, in 10 years. They will also roll out larger ships and submarines more suitable for blue water operations. But generally speaking, they will continue to focus on unmanned platforms, whether it is ground, at sea, or in the air. So Iran is trying to simultaneously project itself as having the capabilities of a regional power and due to a lack of resources, half committing to a bunch of fronts rather than probably doing this smart thing and committing to just one or two. As in the areas that we've seen Iran prioritize over the past, it has gained quite a lot of ground. In Iraq, for instance, it's managed to capture the government and most of the media inside the country, with even US officials at one point admitting that Iran had effective control over the country. But even as impressive as Tehran might feel that is, that their influence in the Kurdish areas is still pretty touch and go, and that if there were an Iraqi election to turn against them, that much of this decades of progress could all be undone. And this same dichotomy is playing out just to the west in Syria, which, yes, Iranian forces have made massive progress in, and the war is slowly coming to a close, but sitting at the negotiating table isn't really Tehran. In fact, the negotiation table these days is mostly between Ankara and Moscow, neither of which are perfect solutions. When we then pan over to the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf, both of which are viewed as points of pride for the Iranian Navy, we have to keep the golden rule in the back of our mind, that as big as the Iranian Navy's rhetoric has been in this region, area denial is not the same as area control. And whilst these fleets of torpedo boats and small ships do pose a threat to tankers and coastal ships, they'd have a much harder time taking on something like a carrier battle group. And just because you can close a strait doesn't mean you can keep it closed forever or do it without hurting your own economy. If we then move to the east, we see that Pakistan and Baluchistan are continuing to splinter with many of those problems blowing into the Baluch areas of Iran. Afghanistan has carried out an open attack on Iran's eastern border looking for water. And even tiny Turkmenistan has more capable armored units than all of Iran does. So even out here in the east, 
there's no easy friends to be had. But in all honesty though, the Caucasus right now are probably at the front taking up a lot of Tehran's attention at the moment. With the Ayatollah now watching to see if a further emboldened Azerbaijan may choose to cut off a crucial transport lane that Iran relies on to work with Russia, or even worse, choose to ramp up the rhetoric around a greater Azerbaijan, a country that would extend from the borders of southern Russia all the way down to just west of Tehran. And after years of repressing the Azeri populations in the northwest of the country, Tehran would be hard pressed to guarantee that the ethnic Azeris living in this area would come to Iran's aid if push came to shove between themselves and Azerbaijan. Even when it comes to their military defense industry, Iran seems to have tried to take the same route as a nation like North Korea, attempting to build independence and self reliance within the defense industry, but forgetting that unlike North Korea, it has more than one enemy along its border, and if they continue to prioritize this self reliance, this trend is only set to get worse over time. The current path would seem to many outside observers to be unsustainable, with many outsiders calling for Iran to specialize and double down on areas where they have a proven track record of success, like missile production and drone manufacturing, where the country actually punches well above their weight. But by specializing in certain industries, they'll need to partner up with other ones to fill the gaps left behind, which would probably require them bolting themselves to a player like Russia or China, something that a lot of Iranians would be very hesitant to do. But that's the reality. Either the country adapts and reworks many of the policies that have been holding it back for a few decades now, or otherwise, they can always just stay the course and try and attempt to squeeze another decade out of those old F4 phantoms. Thank you so much for checking out the show this week at our new release time of Monday mornings. We haven't decided if this will be a permanent thing yet, but we're always looking to try new things out. If you want to keep up to date with any changes that we make like this or any other information we have about the show, you can find all of our links and info on Twitter, Reddit, Instagram, Facebook, Discord, and TikTok on the handle at the Redline Pod. Or you can follow me on Twitter. I'm on the handle at Mike Elliott Oz, Oz is in Australia. This show is completely funded by our amazing Patreons who donate a small amount of money each month to help myself and the team keep the show going. And speaking of our amazing Patreons, I want to give a special thanks to Cameron Kane, Dave Baggett, Connor McClory, Polyglot Aaron. Annie Ortlieb, and David, who are the latest patrons to sign up as of time of recording. This show is only possible with the support of listeners like this, and we are incredibly appreciative of their support. So if you feel you have a couple of dollars you could spare, and you like what we do here at the show, we greatly appreciate it. But for now, this episode on Iran's strategic doctrine is all thanks to you guys. As usual, here are our three book recommendations. The first is The Battle of the Ayatollahs, by this week's guest Alex Vitanka, for a look at how the theocratic system plays out in Iran. The second is Three Dangerous Men by Seth G. Jones for a look at the growing partnerships between Iran, Russia, and China. And the third is Black Wave by Kim Gaddis for a look at the impact of Iran and the Middle East on the global oil and energy markets. I want to thank this week's guests, Michael Reed, Alex Vitanka, and Farzan Nadimi. It was an absolutely brilliant lineup to discuss Iran this week. And in addition, I also want to thank my staff, starting with the primary researchers on this piece, Isaac Gibson, Robbie Sutton, Ahmad Al Ahmad, and Sean Cotalem. Being Iran, there was so much to cover here, but all of you did it absolutely brilliantly. In addition, I'd also like to thank Wade McCarr and Cameron Gale, the show's producers, Perry Grace, Daniela Zavella, Genevieve Donald May, Nate Ostilla, Nick McNally, Sean Cotalem, Isaac Gibbs, Ahmad Al Ahmad, Andrew Garbery, Scott Missler Ferguson, Jemima Pentreath, Ben Nutter, Gabriel Lane, and Robbie Sutton, our research assistants and writers, Jamie Tano, our media director, Raul Devanarayanan, our OSIN analyst, Francis Leach, our director of Breaking News, Mark Spencer, our second voiceover artist, Jonah Gunn, our production assistant, Joe Hawthorne, our audio cleaner, Marissa Rafter, our videographer, and Nick Much, our field correspondent. We have a few new members joining the team, and I'm incredibly excited to see all the great work they do. The Red Line will be back in another fortnight with another international episode. But until then, thank you for listening, and good night. The views and opinions expressed in this episode are solely those of Michael, our guests, and the Redline podcast. They do not represent any government or organization and are solely our own. For more information, please visit theredlinepodcast.com.